Hi friends, uh, once again, welcome back to the nurse channel. So the most awaited nursing officer examination, that is the AIMS Norset examination notification have already declared. So we have uploaded a video, the previous video that will explain to you regarding the notification details and any doubts, any clarifications uh, regarding the notification, uh, you can go through that video and uh, uh, you can clear your doubts. So in advance itself, we have started the preparation for the upcoming nursing officer examination for the AIMS and JIPMA and we have uploaded nearly 10 videos. So in this video also we are I have added uh, 15 important questions which are picture based and uh, it will include it includes picture based explanations and application level questions okay so I request everyone who are watching this video to watch the video till the end without skipping and uh, uh, try to support us by subscribing our channel so straight away without losing time we will move on to the questions that is another important 15 questions which will make you too confident in preparing preparing for the upcoming AIMS, Norset and JIPMER examination. So straight away into the questions. So we will start our session with a very very important question. So as I told in the beginning, uh, you can expect picture based, so many picture based questions also in uh, uh, AIMS, Norset examination. So this is a uh, not a picture based question, it's a picture based explanation I will be giving for the first question. So the first question is in your screen right now. The question is which among the following forceps aid in endotracheal intubation? So the question is which among the following forceps aid in endotracheal intubation and the options for you are first one option A Alice forceps, option B Babcock forceps, option C Gillies forceps and the option number D Magill forceps. So which forceps aid in endotracheal intubation that is the question for you. So what is the answer? <coughs> So definitely the answer is option number D that is a Magill forceps. Okay, Magill forceps is one of the uh, one of the forceps or one of the instruments which has to be present in the crash cart. Okay, so uh, we will see other uh, forceps and what is its uses because this explanation is very very important, very very important. Okay, so first of all we will see about the Magill forceps. So this is a picture of the Magill forceps and you can see a curve here. Okay, so Magill forceps are angled or curved forceps which are used to guide a tracheal tube that means our endotracheal tube into the larynx or a nasogastric tube into the esophagus under direct vision okay so this is a Magill's forceps and you can see a tip that is blunted tip here and we can hold the tube here and we can guide the tube into the mm, uh, uh, into the uh, like a uh, stomach or to the uh, trachea okay so magill forceps they are the angled forceps okay for both for endotracheal intubation and for the nasogastric tube insertion okay so these are the two purposes i think you understood about magill forceps now we will move on to the second option that was the alice forceps okay this is the uh, picture of the alice forceps and these are the toothed surgical instruments okay you can see the tip of the alice forceps it is very much Tooth, you can see it is toothed and it is used to grab, grasp firm tissue such as fascia during the surgery. Okay, so these forceps are used to grasp the firm tissues like fascia. Okay, so this is Alice forceps, very very important. Okay, now we will see the another forceps. This is the Babcock forceps. Okay, Babcock forceps. These are jawed. You can see the tip of the um, forceps. These are the jawed instruments with a smooth end. Okay, so this is not. A toothed one this is a uh, blunted like a smooth end and it allows for more delicate structures okay such as bowel to be held in an a traumatic manner okay so since the end is very much smooth we can hold delicate structures like bowel and it will prevent the trauma during the surgery okay so like uh, this forceps is known as the Babcock forceps okay Babcock okay tip uh, you should understand about the tip and why it is used okay then next about the gillies forceps okay so the gillies forceps are the narrow toothed forceps okay you can see the tip of the gillies forceps there is a narrow tooth you can see and it is often used to grasp the skin but not to grasp the bubble okay so this also can be used to grasp the skin not the bubble because it is toothed and it can perforate so this is gillies forceps okay so <clears throat> 
from the first question itself we are getting an information regarding various instruments in the surgery uh, with the help of pictures okay so the questions can come with uh, asking what is this forceps okay so this is very very important now we will move on to the second question in our series the question is from the obstetrics and gynecology very important question which amniotic fluid test is used to determine fetal lung maturity okay so it's a direct question but very very important which amniotic fluid test is used to determine fetal lung maturity okay and the options for you are option number a ph of the amniotic fluid option number b fern test option number c nitrazine paper test and option number d l bar s ratio test okay so what is the answer for the question which amniotic fluid uh, is used to determine the fetal lung maturity lung maturity okay so what is the answer so the answer is option number d that is l bar s that is lecithin uh, <coughs> And the option number D, L bar is lecithin sphingomyelin uh, ratio test. Okay, so we will have a small explanation about that. So, what is the L bar S? L stands for lecithin and sphingomyelin is the S. Okay, so this is used to determine the fetal lung maturity. And these things, this lecithin and sphingomyelin are lung surfactants that are present in increasing amounts in the maturing fetus. Okay, though past 33 weeks the sphingomyelin levels remain relatively constant okay so i think you understood about this this lecithin and sphingomyelin these are the uh, uh, surfactants which are produced by the developing fetus in a larger amount and after 33 weeks okay after 33 weeks of the gestation what will happen is the sphingomyelin level will remain relatively constant and the lecithin level will be increased so so measuring a ratio of L bar S, that is less than sphingomyelin of 2 is to 1 or greater indicates that the fetus can be safely delivered with functioning lungs. Okay, so a ratio of 2 is to 1 if you are getting then that indicates that the, the baby's lung is matured. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, another options we will see the first option was regarding the pH. So the, what is the amniotic fluid normal pH? The normal amniotic pH is 7 to 7.5 okay the normal amniotic pH is 7 to uh, 7.5 so this is a uh, like a slightly alkaline pH so the vaginal pH is acidic like a 3 to 4 I think so okay so uh, uh, so what is the clinical uh, implicality is so when there is a premature rupture of membrane or an amniotic fluid leakage if you see the vaginal pH the vaginal pH will change okay from the acidic to alkaline okay so uh, that's the uh, that's the importance of checking the amniotic fluid pH in the vaginal area. Okay, so uh, next option was regarding the fern test. So what is a fern test? The fern test refers to detection of a characteristic fern-like pattern of vaginal secretions when a specimen is allowed to dry on a glass slide and is viewed under a low power microscope okay so what it indicates the fern test is most commonly used to provide evidence of the presence of amniotic fluid and it is used in the obstetrics to detect the preterm premature rupture of membrane and or the onset of labor okay so i think this also is clear for you this also related to the um, ph so if there is a premature rupture of membrane and the amniotic fluid is um, uh, leaked into the vagina then that secretion if we are testing under a microscope we can see a fern like pattern so that is known as a fern test and this is this is this is used to, to detect premature rupture of membrane okay so next is the uh, next test was a nitrazine paper test okay so this is also based on the ph so it is done to ascertain the nature of fluid in the vagina during the pregnancy especially when there is a premature rupture of membrane is suspected okay so um, in this question so you are getting answer for the another uh, uh, questions also like uh, lung maturity that lecithin sphingomyelin ratio and the other tests like a ph nitrazine paper test fern test all these things are used for detecting whether the premature rupture of membrane brain has happened or not okay so that is a, a second question now we will move on to the third question in our series and the question is here choose the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in early childhood okay so the question is the most common cause of iron deficiency anemia in early childhood and the options for you are option number a chronic diseases option number d nutritional factors 
ऑप्शन नंबर सी क्रॉनिक ब्लीडिंग एंड ऑप्शन नंबर डी आयन अब्सॉर्प्शन डिसऑर्डर्स सो विच अमंग द फॉलोइंग इज द मोस्ट कॉमन कॉज ऑफ आयन डेफिशिएंसी इन अर्ली चाइल्डहुड ओके सो वेरी इजी क्वेश्चन सो व्हाट इज द आंसर सो हियर द आंसर इज ऑप्शन नंबर बी दैट इज न्यूट्रिशनल फैक्टर्स ओके सो यू शुड अंडरस्टैंड व्हाट ऑल थिंग्स कैन लीड टू Uh, and deficiency anemia in early childhood and the common causes include the first one is insufficient intake that is nutritional problems together with rapid growth okay so the early childhood period means there will be rapid growth so uh, adequate intake of nutrients is necessary so there will be an imbalance between the intake and their and growth okay so that is the main reason for the iron deficiency anemia in early childhood and along with that other reasons include if the baby born with a low birth weight and if there is any gastrointestinal losses there are chances of getting iron deficiency anemia so this one the insufficient intake stands the first and the common reason for the development of iron deficiency anemia in early childhood okay so that also is a very very simple question now we will move on to the fourth question in our series and the question is which in which of the following diseases the auto antigens are beta cells okay so again uh, a very simple question but direct question but you should think and answer in which of the following diseases the auto antigens are beta cells and the options for you are first one is option number a myasthenia gravis option number b insulin dependent diabetes option number c multiple sclerosis and option number d chronic anemia so in, in which of these diseases uh, the beta cells are the auto antigens auto antigens means though we are asking about an autoimmune disease and the beta cells are affected so these are the clues for this question so what is the answer it's a direct simple question and the answer is option number b that is idd insulin dependent diabetes mellitus okay so you know that beta cells produce the insulin so with that itself you can come to the answer for this question so we'll have a small explanation regarding this question in iddm that is a insulin dependent diabetes mellitus the auto antigens are beta cells okay these are beta cells so auto antigens means these are the substances of the patient's body that develop antigenic activity and hence destroy the patient's body cells and tissues okay so the beta cells are producing the insulin so here what is happening is auto antigens antigens these beta cells itself will get destroyed by the um, uh, will get destroyed and the patient can develop the insulin dependent diabetes mellitus okay so i think that also is clear for you now we will move on to the very next question that is the fifth question in our series the question is the question very very important question disruption of the nodes of ranvier is the key pathophysiology in which disease okay so the question is disruption of nodes of nodes of ranvier is the key pathophysiology in which disease and the options are multiple sclerosis option number b myasthenia gravis option number d c gillen barre syndrome and option number d muscular dystrophy so what is the answer nodes of ranvier are getting affected in which disease condition so that is a in a simple way okay so what is the answer yeah the answer is option number c that is a gulen barre syndrome okay so we know that um, uh, the gulen barre syndrome it is an autoimmune polyneuropathy which is characterized by acute and progressive limb weakness okay there will be acute and progressive limb weakness and the recent evidence shows that the disruption of the nodes of ranvier is the key pathophysiology in the axonal forms of gulen barre syndrome okay so what is this nodes of ranvier so we can see the nodes of ranvier here these are the uninsulated part of the neuron okay so the uninsulated part of the neuron and the purpose of this nodes of ranvier is to it's a rapid electrical contraction is the purpose of uh, 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 that is a function of this nodes of ranvier and in the gillen barre syndrome that these nodes of ranvier are getting affected okay so i think that also is clear for you very very important question so now uh, we will move on to Mm, the other options like uh, the multiple sclerosis so what is multiple sclerosis this is also known as the encephalomyelitis disseminata and it is a most common demyelinating disease the same demyelinating disease in which uh, the myelin that is a covering of the nerve cells in the brain and the spinal cords are getting damaged so that is multiple sclerosis then 
another option was the myasthenia gravis so myasthenia gravis it is a long term neuromuscular disease that leads to varying degrees of skeletal muscle weakness okay it will de leads to varying de de uh, degrees of skeletal muscle weakness and the most commonly affected muscles are those of the eyes face and with the swallowing okay so that is myasthenia gravis so and the final option was regarding the muscular dystrophy so what is muscular dystrophy muscular dystrophies are a genetically and clinically heterogeneous group of rare neuromuscular diseases that cause progressive weakness and breakdown of skeletal muscles over time okay so what all options what i have given is some more the other forms of demyelinating or um, muscle weakness diseases okay but the question was regarding the nodes of ranvier are affected in which disease that is guillain barre syndrome okay so i think you are getting idea about some in some information regarding these four diseases okay now we will move on to uh, the sixth question in our series so this is uh, an application level question regarding rheumatoid arthritis and the question is which of the following statements is incorrect regarding rheumatoid arthritis okay so you have to find out the incorrect statement regarding rheumatoid arthritis from the options what i am going to give so the options are first option it is an autoimmune disorder option number b it occurs only in old people option number c it is an inflammation of synovial fluid and option number d it can be diagnosed by the presence of rheumatoid factor so among this which statement is wrong regarding rheumatoid arthritis that's a task for you so what is the answer so obviously it's a simple very simple question and the answer is option number b it occurs only in old people no it can occur in any age group okay so we have a small explanation so rheumatoid arthritis you know that it is also an autoimmune disorder that can occur at any age not only for not on, on, only for uh, only the old age the primary symptom is the inflammation of the synovial membrane okay so that was there in our option and if it is left untreated then the membrane thickens and the synovial fluid increases and it exerts pressure that can cause pain okay so this is a rough a small uh, explanation regarding the rheumatoid arthritis okay so i think that also is clear for you now we will move on to the seventh question in our series this is a picture based very very important question and the task for you is to identify the structure marked okay so with this black arrow i have marked the structure and you have to identify the structure okay so what is the structure the word uh, what is this this is a structure of this is a picture of a heart okay then you can identify the uh, answer very easily and the options for you are first one is the tricuspid valve option number b mitral valve option number c aortic valve and option number d pulmonic valve so what is a uh, structure what is a structure uh, what i have marked so what is the answer so the answer for this uh, question is yeah definitely it is a mitral valve okay mitral or the bicuspid valve okay so we will have a small explanation uh, about the valves of the heart so this is the structure of the heart and we can see this is the right atrium this is this space is the right atrium and this is the right ventricle and uh, between the right atrium and the right ventricle we have the tricuspid valve which have three cusps okay in the old picture also you can see we can see three cusps here that is known as the tricuspid valve okay so this is a tricuspid valve then between the left atrium and the left ventricle we have the bicuspid valve or the mitral valve two cusps are there this is a mitral valve and uh, from the right ventricle blood will flow to the you know that to the pulmonary trunk and here we have a valve known as the pulmonary valve and from the left ventricle the blood will pump to rest of the body uh, through the aorta and here we have the aortic valve okay so these are the valves okay of the heart tricuspid valve bicuspid or the mitral valve then pulmonic valve and aortic valve okay so i think uh, this is also clear for you now we will move on to the very next question in our series and the question is eighth question inability to or difficulty in expressing one's own emotions is known as so the question is inability to or difficulty in expressing one's own emotions is known as dash and the options are option number a euthymia 
ऑप्शन नंबर बी एलेक्सी थाइमिया ऑप्शन नंबर सी यूफोरिया एंड ऑप्शन नंबर डी एनहेडोनिया सो व्हाट इज अ आंसर सो इट्स क्वाइट कंफ्यूजिंग सो डोंट बी कंफ्यूज्ड रीड द क्वेश्चन केयरफुली एंड आंसर द क्वेश्चन इनएबिलिटी टू और डिफिकल्टी इन एक्सप्रेसिंग इमोशंस डिफिकल्टी so what is the answer the answer is option number b that is alexithymia okay alexithymia is the answer so we will see the other, another options also so first what we will see what is alexithymia it is a personality trait which is characterized by the subclinical inability to identify and describe emotions experienced by oneself okay so this is the inability to identify and describe emotions experienced by oneself so the core characteristics of alexithymia is marked by the dysfunction in emotional awareness social attachment and interpersonal uh, relations okay so that is alexithymia so then what is uh, euphoria euphoria you know that that is a stage 1 of mania that is a hyper mood so mild elevation of the mood in which the feeling of elevated mood with optimism and self satisfaction not keeping with the ongoing events and it is usually seen in hypomania cases so euphoria is a stage 1 and other stages are there you can refer later that relation act to see like that okay so that is euphoria so then what is the anhedonia so anhedonia is a lack of pleasure in acts which are normally normally pleasurable okay so lack of pleasure in acts which are normally pleasurable okay so euthymia what is euthymia euthymia is a normal tranquil mental state or mood okay so euthymia is normal and hedonia is the lack of pleasure in normally pleasurable activities then <coughs> euphoria is the elevation of the mood and alexithymia is a difficulty in expressing one's own emotions okay so i think uh, that also is very very important and you got some information now we will move on to the ninth question in our series and the question is chronic lithium toxicity may manifest as so you should read the question very clearly here it is asked about the chronic lithium toxicity okay so with that itself you can come to the answer for this question and the options for you are first option is a hyper reflexia option number b vomiting option number c tachycardia and option number d nausea so chronic lithium toxicity may manifest as dash simple question but you should understand something that i will explain in the explanation session so the answer for this question is now it is option number a hyper reflexia okay so you should understand what all are the symptoms in the acute and chronic toxicity states so in the acute toxicity state people have primarily gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea vomiting diarrhea and it can result in the volume depletion also but in the chronic toxicity cases the people have primarily neurological symptoms which includes nystagmus tremors hyper reflexia ataxia changes in the mental status etc okay so our question was regarding the chronic lithium toxicity so the answer is hyper reflexia okay so i think that also is clear for you now now we will move on to the next question in our series that is a 10th question so very very important very very important question which of the following anti epileptic drug may produce teratogenicity so which among the following can cause teratogenic effect teratogenic means harmful to the baby so the options are option number a phenytoin option number b valproate or valproic acid option number c topiramate and another final option all of the above so which among the following antiepileptic drug may produce teratogenicity so what is the answer so the answer is all of these drugs all of these drugs are teratogenic okay so then which drug can be given during the pregnancy and epileptic drug that we will explain in the explanation section so each drug what will happen so if in toin you know that the fetal head and toin syndrome okay fetal head and toin syndrome also called as the fetal dilantin syndrome it is a group of defects caused to the developing fetus by exposure to the teratogenic of uh, effects of the phenytoin okay so eptoin can cause hydantoin or the dilantin fetal dilantin syndrome then the next drug was the valproate or the valproic acid it has a well known teratogenic potential causing a variety of birth defects including neural tube defects okay so valproic acid can result in the neural tube defects and other congenital malformations then next comes the topiramate so topiramate in the first trimester can cause the increased risk of oral cleft because it can affect the cartilages so that is cleft lift 
with or without cleft palate in the offsprings okay so topiramate also cannot be used during the pregnancy because of its teratogenic effects on the cartilage of the offsprings okay so then which drug can be given during the pregnancy that is lamotrigine and levetiracetam that is a levipil and lamotrigine are the safer of the medicines reviewed during pregnancy and epileptic medicines okay so uh, here also you are getting a bunch of information that is phenytoin, hydantoin syndrome, then uh, valproic acid can result in other congenital malformations, then um, this uh, topiramate can result in the cartilaginous uh, issues. Okay, So, lamotrigine and levetiracetam are safer during pregnancy. That is a summary of the question, 10th question. So, now we will move on to the 11th question, it's a basic uh, physiology question is, aldosterone is produced from which layer of adrenal cortex? So the question is very simple, very direct, basic physiology, aldosterone is produced from which layer of adrenal cortex? So you should understand about the layers of adrenal cortex and you can answer this question very easily. So the options are option number A, zona glomerulosa, option number B, zona fasciculator, option number C, zona reticularis and option number D, all the above, from all the layers, adrenal, uh, aldosterone is secreted. So what is the answer? Aldosterone which layer adrenal cortex so the answer is option number a zona glomerulosa okay so we know that we have three layers in the adrenal cortex so the three layers are zona glomerulosa zona fasciculata and zona reticularis zona glomerulosa is the outermost layer of the adrenal cortex and it secretes the hormone named aldosterone zona fasciculata is the middle layer which secretes the hormone cortisol and zona reticularis is the inner layer which secretes the sex cortisol so that is a androgens okay so uh, these are the three layers of the adrenal cortex so adrenal medulla is another part that uh, you can refer later that also is very very important so this is a just a basic physiology now we will move on to the 12th question in our series and the question is which test is predominantly used as a diagnostic marker for alcoholic and chronic liver diseases okay so the question is which is a diagnostic marker for alcoholic and chronic liver diseases okay so the options are option number a gtt option number b ggt option number c alp and option number d afp so ab these abbreviations now you can expand and you can find out the answer for this question so which is a specific biomarker specific diagnostic markers for alcoholic and chronic liver diseases okay so what is the answer it will be slightly confusing but it's a very simple very important question so the answer here is ggt what is ggt that we will see now ggt is the elevated ggt that is the gamma glutamate transferase it can be found in diseases of the liver biliary system pancreas and kidneys okay so what is this ggt this ggt is a gamma glutamate transferase it is an enzyme which is present all over the body but especially it is produced in large quantities by the liver okay so whenever there is a liver cells hepatocytes destruction this will be released into the bloodstream and the levels will be increased and it can happen in uh, liver diseases not only for the liver diseases but more in the liver diseases but it can give a clue about the biliary system pancreas and the kidney diseases okay so the normal you should understand what is a normal ggt ggt so normal ggt it differs from lab to lab but approximately it is kept as 5 to 40 units per liter so the normal ggt is 5 to 40 units per liter and in alcoholics what is happening is the ggt is elevated by ingestion of large quantities of alcohol you know that the alcohol molecules it can disintegrate and can destroy the hepatocytes that physiology you know so the ggt will be released into the bloodstream and it will be increased in the alcoholic patients okay if they are taking alcohol in a larger quantity okay so we will see the another options also so another option was the alp so what is alp alp is the alanine transaminase so this is also a liver biomarker but mainly it is a first test can be done for the biliary diseases okay and uh, this also can be used but more commonly we are using ggt okay so alp stands for alanine transaminate and it is the first test for the biliary diseases and next one is the afp that you know alpha fetoprotein alpha fetoprotein it is a tumor marker test which may be used to help confirm or roll out a diagnosis of the liver cancer or cancer of the ovaries 
or testis, testicles okay so these are some biomarkers important biomarkers and uh, for confusing you we, i have given you another option that is a gtt so gtt is extremely different this is a glucose tolerance test and it is a medical test in which the glucose is given and the blood samples are taken afterwards in a periodic manner to determine how quickly it is cleared from the blood okay so you can refer out so uh, how what is the time interval between each test in the glucose tolerance test that you can find out refer okay that is also is important okay so that's all regarding that question now we will move on to the 13th question in our series this is from the um, community the question is what is the who recommendation in pregnancy for iron and folic acid for developing countries okay so for developing countries like india what is the who recommendation in pregnancy for iron and folic acid so what is the dose so the answers are options are option number a 400 microgram of folic acid and 60 milligram of iron option number b 800 microgram of folic acid and 60 milligram of iron option number c 400 microgram of folic acid and 80 milligram of iron and the final option is 800 microgram of folic acid and 80 milligram of iron so slightly confusing so you have to buy hard that is a only option so what is the answer the answer is option number a that is 400 microgram of folic acid and 60 milligram of iron then how frequently that i will explain now so 400 microgram of folic acid and 60 milligram of iron daily for six months okay this is od for six months during pregnancy and during the postpartum time three months postpartum in areas of the world with poor nutrition okay so uh, that is also it's very very important so either they can ask during the postpartum period or during the pregnancy time how much to be taken so uh, folic acid and iron both are very very important okay so now we'll move on to the second last question in our series and the question is which is the preferred therapy in patients with symptomatic acute hypocalcemia okay so you should read the question very carefully because i have given here some uh, key points like the preferred therapy preferred therapy in patients with symptomatic acute hypocalcemia okay symptomatic acute hypocalcemia so which form of calcium we used to give the options are option number a calcium gluconate option number b calcium carbonate option number c calcium citrate and option number d vitamin d so what is the preferred therapy for acute symptomatic hypocalcemia so obviously answer is option number a that is calcium gluconite okay so we know that in patients with acute symptomatic hypocalcemia intravenous calcium gluconite is the preferred therapy whereas chronic hypocalcemia patient should be treated with oral calcium compounds and vitamin d supplements okay so the question was regarding acute symptomatic so for the acute cases intravenous therapy is the favor is the uh, therapy of choice and we have to give calcium gluconate and in chronic cases we have to give calcium supplements and vitamin d supplements okay so why what happen if you give a uh, um, calcium uh, bicarbonate or the calcium citrate iv so the to avoid the precipitation of the calcium salts these phosphates and the bicarbonate should not be infused with the calcium okay so to prevent the precipitation that is the reason why we are not giving calcium carbonate and other compounds so calcium carbonate um, in other way it is a dietary supplement which is used when the amount of calcium taken in the diet is not enough and calcium citrate also is a calcium salt of citric acid and it is also commonly used as a food additive usually as a preservative and but sometimes for the flavor okay so these are the uh, ways the calcium uh, calcium is supplemented in our diet okay so calcium gluconate for the iv and calcium carbonate and calcium citrate and vitamin d supplements for the chronic cases of hypocalcemia okay so i think that also is clear for you now we will move on to the very last question in the series and the question is international self-care day is celebrated on so another important question international self-care day is celebrated on which date and the options are 24th july option number b 5th may option number c 24th march and option number d 29th september okay so uh, which day is celebrated as the international self-care day so what is the answer 
So the answer is option number A, 24th July. So uh, there are some another peculiarity for the peculiarity for the other options also that we will see in the explanation. So we know that the 5th May is uh, celebrated as the World Hand Hygiene Day. Okay, World Hand Hygiene Day is 5th May. Then 24th March is uh, as the World TB Day. So 24th July already we have explained. 24th July is the International Self Care Day. 24th March is the uh, World TB Day. Then 9th September is the World Heart Day. Okay, sorry, 29th September is the World Heart Day. Okay, so these are the other uh, important dates that you can remember. So with that, uh, we are coming to the end of the session. So today what we have discussed that nearly 15 questions we have discussed is very very important so uh, kindly uh, watch uh, till the end and uh, kindly share about this platform to your other friends also so once again thanking you all for watching the video so stay tuned and uh, we will be coming with another video very shortly so prepare well once again all the very best for your examinations and uh, it's a time to sign out so see you soon in the another video till that time bye thank you